Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Secrets of the Viz. Today I have Danny, who is here to share a very interesting and personal viz that he did for Iron Viz last year on saving the elephants. So over to you, Danny, to give a short intro about yourself. Thanks, Lewis. Yeah, hi everyone. Danny Bradley here, Tableau Public Ambassador. Uh, sorry, no, I'm not. I'm Tableau Social Ambassador. I always say Tableau Public Ambassador. I'm on it so much, right? I think that's why I say Tableau. I mean, you've uh, been doing a lot of Tableau Public visits uh, that are great. That's so right, yeah. Yeah. Maybe it's Tableau. time to change few. It might be, yeah. Maybe I'll apply for the public stuff uh, next time. <laughs> uh, I also lead the Tableau Northeast user group here in the UK as well. I've been using Tableau uh, for longer than I care to remember. Probably version 8, I think. Uh, was the when I first started using it, which was a very long time that, ago. That is a long time ago. Yeah, I guess I was using it for what lots of people use it for at the start, which is replicating Excel, building tables, that kind of old story. But then it wasn't until 2018 that I attended Tableau Conference Europe, kind of had my light bulb moment and realized what Tableau was actually all about and how to use it and discovered this amazing community. And ever since then, it's just it, my, my love for Tableau and the community has grown. That was uh, a learning experience of, of its own. Cool. So since you have been there from like version 8 or something, mm. what are the things that you've seen Tableau change over the years? Yeah, I think um, that whole drag and drop ethos for me just made me fall in love with the product. It made it really easy coming from a kind of SQL background. I think what I do love about Tableau and the way they do things is the fact that they really listen to the community when it comes to the ideas and they implement those with what I generally refer to as a fairly aggressive release program, right? So yeah, that's the thing for me that uh, Tableau stood the test of time. I think that makes a lot of sense. So today we want to talk a little bit on your previous IMVs entry uh, on saving the elephants. I, I read it in your opening paragraph that this was kind of like a tribute to your late grandmother. So maybe just give us a little background about how this vis came about in general. Yeah, I think when the subject of love came out for iInvis for that year, I had a few different ideas. And one of them that came through was my love for nature and animals purely because of my grandmother's love for it and the, for all the work that she did with it when she was a youngster um, in India. So you don't have to delve too deep into the data to understand the problems that lots of endangered animals face, especially with the African elephant and the ivory poaching. But I really wanted to just look at the story behind what's happening, given that they were so rife just a couple of hundred years ago and the inspiration for this came from being able to link it into the work that, that my grandmother did on caring for those elephants all those years ago. It just made sense as a tribute to her with her recent sort of passing. And I just thought it would tie in those two elements nicely together. So it just felt the right thing to do. That's beautiful. So what did your grandmother do in relation with elephants? Was she like a zookeeper or was she kind of no, uh, she, part of uh, it? So she was a, a volunteer, essentially. Mm -hmm. It was something that she wanted to do and understand for herself exactly how they were being cared for, how they were living. The poaching at the time was absolutely rife. There weren't that many rules and restrictions around it. So she wanted to go over there and help fight that cause and protect the elephants. It was a dream of hers that she was uh, very fortunate to fulfill. That's really noble. I think this vis is interesting because one of my projects in my master's program was mm -hmm. also about the endangerment of animals, mm -hmm. in particularly tigers. Over the past centuries, the population of tigers had gone down by 97%, which mm -hmm. is also the same problem in your elephant vis, and it's due to poaching and there's over poaching in general. And I think Societies have been trying to reverse what they've done over the past centuries, but yeah. Yeah, it only took so many poor animals to die for us to wake up from that. It's really heartbreaking, to be honest. Yeah, it, it, it really is. And especially when using Makeover Monday, a lot of the subject matter was always quite somber. So you've got to be really careful about how you visualize data that is so sensitive. So yeah, I think hence why the colors were so simple in it and the visualizations were relatively simple because trying to tell a not very nice story through data can be quite difficult. There were lots of iterations of the visualization to get to the point that I did. For me personally, I discovered lots of cultural differences between different parts of the world and to how people treat certain breeds of animals or whatever it might be. It's, it's really important that if you're going to visualize something like that is to do the research. I spent, I don't know how many hours I spent researching the African elephant and the list of data sources that are in the viz speak for itself. When you go into a project like that, you really do have to fully immerse yourself in that world 
to give you yourself that education so that you can portray your story across and not be biased by your own thinkings or it might be. So it was a tough one to visualize. Definitely. So earlier on, you were talking a little bit on your choice of colors. Maybe walk us through your design process in selecting mm. the colors. The way I like to design anything is I'll generally start off in, in black and white and I'll just add color where I feel there's things that I want to highlight. I mean, it completely depends on the story that I'm trying to tell. The background color was something that I wrestled with quite a lot. I had used what I would call the Financial Times beige in the background. And then when I'd added in my red afterwards, it just looked like a print from the Financial Times. And I didn't really want that for something that was such a personal, emotive visualization, certainly to me. So I decided to play around with the colors and I wanted something still very neutral, but easy on the eye. And blue is obviously a, a very calming color. And I thought I wanted people to subconsciously feel as calm as possible while they're reading things about the African elephant. But, you know, it's it's the age old thing, isn't it? Keeping it as simple as possible. Yeah, I think the red that you have selected works very well with the subtle blue in the background to create that kind of that contrast. And I love how you have laid out everything, even just using colors to highlight the different countries when you select, mm -hmm. let's say, Tanzania, oh, yeah. Cameroon, and Nigeria. I, th I thought that was a really nice touch. Walk us through the charts that you have used to tell yep. your story and what were challenging things that you want to bring to light. Yeah, absolutely. I think in terms of the charts themselves, if we just jump back to the, the history and the decline, what I wanted the first chart to be really dramatic and given the data that I pulled, the estimated elephant populations in 1920 it was 10 million. If we look at that now, it's obviously it's reduced drastically. Now, I couldn't really find any data in between. It was just an estimation, but that's why I've called it out there in the annotation. But what I wanted to do was essentially ask a question in my title, which is something that I do in both my personal visits and my work visits. So how much has the African elephant population declined in the last 100 years? I think using the red really helps. And what I wanted to do was just call out kind of three specific areas along the line chart, which just show that dramatic decline and a little bit of a resurgence between 95 and 2015. When it comes to the chart on the right hand side of this, what I wanted to do then was delve into where have we seen the biggest declines or the biggest increases in terms of the countries used? So Tanzania's population of African elephants was huge. We can see that between 2007 and 2015, the elephant numbers changed by minus 53.7%, which in just a few short years is a really drastic decrease. Whereas if we hover over any of the others, Botswana, really high numbers, but the numbers haven't changed drastically. A 1.6% decline might not necessarily be a bad thing because that might just be natural deaths, right? So the slope chart here really emphasizes that. Something that I did struggle with at first because I'd not actually used it before was the dynamic zone visibility. So I've got three charts in the background doing the same sort of thing. But then when you click on each of these countries, the title changes, the text changes, the axis itself is changing, so it looks a lot more dramatic. However, what I'm trying to do here is, from here, you can't really see the big changes, right? Because the pure volume of elephants in these three countries are absolutely massive. So Cameroon has a much smaller population. However, you can see that there has been a massive increase in that. But that's wanting to call out the data. That's not necessarily because there was an actual increase, but what I did discover was that different aerial methods of, of data collation actually changed drastically. So it might not be actually the elephants themselves. Yeah, I think you've nailed this section really well, because like you say, you started with the grand picture of showing that huge decline in the past century and just highlighting three unique stories. But, and I think that kind of builds a lot of context around why the numbers are de decreasing. I think that it's really useful mm -hmm. for anyone who is not familiar with this topic. Now they have a baseline of what's happening. And I think that flows really nicely to your next section. I could have gone down so many avenues with this, but yeah, that kind of made me then go off and research, well, why is that generally happening? What I had noticed is that the fewer elephants that were left on our planet, then the higher the price of ivory. And what I wanted to do was dig into why it was still being bought even at such high prices. 
what I found out that it was a lot of it could be to do with China's economic growth. China's middle class was absolutely booming and demand for that product had soared because it's seen as a symbol of wealth within the country of having ivory items within the household. So what I did was I split this up into two charts. So the first one was this sort of uh, barbell chart. This was just wanting to show the shift from 2011 to 2019, the shift from poor and low income over to middle and upper middle incomes. And that's just one contributing factor to the demand for ivory. So we can see that the high incomes has increased 200%, upper middle increased 290%, and middle income increased 103%. So really massive shifts in wealth, which makes sense, right? Because so if I were to pitch in on that, this whole ivory and all the different gemstones got into popularities because of the ancient dynasties. I've read about this in a couple of museums because I, I love visiting museums when I go to a new country. So their emperors like to go on hunting parties and they'll bring back the carcasses and make jewelry as like a trophy or a mark mm -hmm. of their skills. And I think ivory tusks and tiger's teeth became a symbol of power and okay. were yeah. often made into like necklaces, bracelets, rings, and so on and so forth. Thankfully, we have evolved past that over the past centuries. Yeah. We have found better alternatives to fashion and symbol of power. Yeah, yeah. I like to think I like so, to think yeah. so yeah. too. <laughs> yeah. And then moving on down, which is the poachers section. Essentially, what I wanted to do here was highlight to the reader that we're not talking about just the illegal killing of, of African elephants. What happens is when researchers go out, they're logging every carcass that they find. But what I wanted to do here was highlight by country the number of illegal carcasses that are found and then also compare that to the total number of carcasses that had been found. Just to say deaths aren't necessarily all because of poaching. Big fan of a map. And if we actually click on Kenya, then what we're going to find is it's actually very low down on the list. So although it had the most number of carcasses that were found, only 34% of those were deemed to be illegal. I thought that was a really interesting way of looking at the data. Whereas if we look at somewhere like Liberia, you've got only 11 were found and 10 were illegal, right? So again, it was allowing the user to explore this data for themselves because I didn't want to exclude any data, right? This is really interesting because of how many levels of dimension you have built into it. And I think it adds to that entire narrative around the poachers. Because ultimately, this topic is very heavy and mm -hmm. we want them to walk away with insights that they can probably take action with. Yeah, it's important to me that if I can, I've got a call to action um, in any of my visualizations. So if you want to help this fantastic cause around Save the Elephants, which is specific to African elephants, you can click the donate button here. Uh, you can learn more literally just about by going on this visualization and seeing what their mission is. What brought it full circle for me was that this is exactly what my grandmother did back in the late 70s if she was around and could have seen this visualization i think she'd have been really happy with it i'm sure your grandmother will be really proud of you for making this fist so speaking of that is there anything that you are currently working on that you might want to tease the audience a little bit let me think i did have a really good idea for my iron viz for this year around music essentially the song mr brightside by the killers has mm. been in the uk chart for something like 486 weeks continuously. It was the recently named the biggest song of all time, never to reach number one. And it overtook Wonderwall by Oasis as the biggest song of all time, not to reach number one. So there's definitely a story in that. And I, I had actually gone through quite a lot of work, but it was just proving to be really difficult to do. So that's what I'd like to work on next, but we'll see. <laughs> you know what? I'm going to make a prediction here because we had Data Plus movies. We have Data Plus TVs. Yeah. I have a feeling there's going to be Data Plus music this year. I would put some money on that for sure. And um, you could probably let this idea brew a little bit till yeah, this year's yeah, idea. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. That would be awesome. If, if it does come true, you can call me the Oracle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll say, oh, I wonder how you knew. <laughs> Thank you so much, Danny, for walking us through this really personal vis. I think this plays a very nice tribute to your grandmother who has done great work for the elephant community. 
I hope everyone learned something new from this and we'll see everyone at the next episode. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Are you a huge coffee drinker? I am actually, yeah. Okay. Have you heard of elephant dung coffee? I haven't actually, no. Okay, so in some parts of Thailand, they have something where they feed the elephants coffee mm -hmm. beans as part of their diet. And they claim that the digestive system of the elephants actually changed the composition of the coffee and they retrieve the coffee from their wow. food and, you know, clean it out, obviously. And, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. and, yeah, and those yeah. coffee are really, really expensive. It's like wow. probably 500 to a grand just for a bag. Yeah. But uh, I, I don't know how I feel about this. Uh, I mean, a, a, apart from the poop side, but just introducing this to an animal's diet, I don't think mm -hmm. that is something that should be happening naturally or... No. Like, yeah. No. Right. No, I think, yeah, the word exploitation of the poor elephant comes into mind there when you're talking like that. I'm a big coffee fan. I actually switched to only drinking decaf about a year ago. I've got a, a bean to cup coffee machine at home and I've been on a hunt for kind of the best decaf coffee bean that I can find because I love strong coffee, but I don't like the, the caffeine, right? So I'm still exploring and spending probably too much money on coffee beans. You do know that decaf coffee also still has a little bit of caffeine left. It does. Yeah, no, it absolutely does. But I went through a phase of drinking lots of non-caffeinated, really good strong coffee. There was a bit too much alertness going on for my liking. I was like, oh no, coffee's like, coffee's not great if you have too much of it. It's How many thing. cups of coffee do you drink a day to keep yourself awake for so well, long? Well, I think yeah, at the time I was probably doing four or five cups of coffee a day, mm. but it was all done in a cafetiere, as strong as you could possibly get it, big cups. Gotcha. And I was going to the gym a lot at the time as well. So kind of helped for workouts and things like that, but. Yeah, I wouldn't recommend it. And now I'm just fully decaf, but trying to find really good flavors and ethical ways of sourcing the beans. I'm sure there's probably a visualization in that coming up somewhere. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's an idea. <laughs>